Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Barakah Anabiyyina Muhammad Wa Ba'd Do you guys remember the surah that the Imam was reciting the most throughout this tarawih this night? Remember that? Surah Al-Baqarah, right? Which surah was he reciting? Surah Al-Kahf Obviously everybody remembers Surah Al-Kahf because it's easy, we recite that almost every Friday and it's a very important surah, probably he's memorized the first 10 ayat or the last 10 ayat because of what? What did the Prophet ﷺ say about memorizing the first 10 or last 10 ayat of Surah Al-Kahf? What does it give you? Jama'ah. Huh? You will be protected. It will give you a shield, protection from what? From the fitna of a Dajjal. From the fitna, the trial of a Dajjal. When the Dajjal comes, if you've memorized the first 10 ayat of Surah Al-Kahf or the last 10 ayat, so therefore better for you to memorize the whole surah, of course, obviously. That means if you do so, you will be protected from the fitna of a Dajjal. Ever wondered why? Why Surah Al-Kahf? What is so unique about Surah Al-Kahf that, that will make it a shield and protection from the fitna of a Dajjal? The ulama, they say, Surah Al-Kahf is actually, it speaks about four major fitan, four major trials, four major temptations, people they go through into their lives, if you put them all combined, it will give the fitna of a Dajjal altogether. So if you learn the lessons that are mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf, you would understand how you protect yourself and you shield yourself from the fitna of a Dajjal. Surah Al-Kahf has four stories. Four stories in Surah Al-Kahf. Do you guys remember these stories? Let's see together if you can remember these stories. Story number one, which one is it? The, the young men of the cave, right? Story number two, which one? Huh? The garden, the two men with the gardens. You know, the rich man and the poor man. And then we have the third story. Story of what? Of who? Musa alayhi salam al Khidr. And the fourth story is the story of who? Dhul Qarnayn. Right? The four stories in Surah Al Kahf. So even though it's called Surah Al Kahf, which is like supposed to be one story, but there are actually four stories, and each story speaks about one particular fitna, one particular temptation. Let's see that together. The first part of the surah, the first story, the story of the young people of the cave. What kind of fitna, what kind of trial did they go through? The fitna of what? Huh? Fitna of the deen, fitna of the faith. They've been tested, they've been tried in regards to their faith, their iman, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By who? Their own people. Their own people. You guys live in America today. This is your home, you're going nowhere, so basically, these are your people. Whether you like it or not, these are your people. The Muslims and the non-Muslims, Wallahi, we're responsible for them. We're responsible for them. So they are our people that we need to care for them, to care, to care about them, and to make sure that they know, at least they have access to the khair that we have, alhamdulillah, we've been given in this, in this dunya. The deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We might be tested. You might be tried in regards to your faith, in regards to your deen. Through whom? Your own people. Could be your own relatives, not just people. Their own relatives, the closest people to you. The people of the cave were tested. They were tried, they were tested, and then they chose to flee. And leave, and just leave that town. They don't want to risk it anymore because they're afraid for their iman and for their deen. So they left everything behind. Some of them of Assyrian, they say in regard to these young men, they were actually from prominent families. They were not from, you know, the mob, from the mass. They're a very elitist community, which is why their disappearance was noticed in the city. And people, they were looking for them. And the stories became legend until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought them back again to life. So people, they say, wow, these are the people that were missing 300 years ago. SubhanAllah, all of this. So they were very well known. And they left everything behind for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sometimes you're going to be tested by you for, in regards to your iman, your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of us specifically today, particularly the youth, the young ones. The young ones, unfortunately, they grow up in a culture about Islam different than the older ones. Those who have the gray hair and their beard and their head, Ya Jama'ah, you grew up when Islam was awesome. Being Muslim was awesome. You grew up in a culture we call it as-sahwa. Awakening, the Muslim community was, mashallah, seeing the beauty of Islam. 
People were coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The masajid are full with worshippers. People give charity. The ihsan and the khair was awesome. It was amazing. So there was a lot of motivation, a lot of incentives for you to be Muslim and to become more practicing. Our younger ones today in America, they're growing up. They don't have these incentives anymore. They're growing up. They're hearing everything negative about Islam. And even when they come home, they don't see you as Muslim probably presenting Islam to them in the way that will be attractive to them. They don't see any difference. And that's why we're having a hard time bringing our youth to Islam, to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a great fitna. We, the parents, sometimes can be causing the fitna to our own youth. We, the community, if we don't show them the meaning of being a beautiful Muslim, the beauty of Islam, the beauty of the community, what does it mean to be a Muslim community? If there is nothing interesting in that for them, they will have a hard time come and follow that path, even if they grow up in a house of Muslim family. So be careful. That's the first fitna, the fitna of al-deen. The second fitna that, that two men of that, of that garden, what kind of fitna do you think they were, they were dealing with? Wealth, finances, money. One of them was rich, one of them was not so rich, right? The one who was rich, he thought that he owns it, Khalas, he got it. And when the other one told him, listen, this girl from, you want from Allah, he said, no, 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 it was me, I'm, I was clever, I was a businessman. You see, I came from XYZ country, whether it's in subcontinent or the Arab world, I came with nothing. Like most of our elders, may Allah protect them, Rabbil Alameen, and give them yani, khair in the dunya the akhirah. They come and they brag about their achievements. When I came, I came with just a suitcase. I had nothing there except a few things, few items, that's all. all. That's all I had. And I did, and I did, and I did, and then, mashallah, great thing they've done, Fisabilillah. And a lot of people, they've came over here, they have achieved a lot of things. Not so much, really, you can be proud of to be Fisabilillah. So the wealth can be a fitna. Can distract people from the purpose of this life and what they're supposed to be doing. And the other one, the poor man, he told him, listen, hey, this is all coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be careful. Allah can take it away from you just like this. And it happened. Allah tested this man with a loss of wealth, subhanAllah. And it was too late for him. I don't want any one of you over here to come in a moment in the life they will say, I wish I've made more ibadah, more ta'a, more charity, more donations, more this and that, to be appreciative to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I wish I've done that before. Don't you ever put yourself in this position. Make sure that you're grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every moment of your life. And be patient if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to test you. May Allah protect you from any test, Ya Rabbil Alameen. The third story, the story of Musa alayhi salam and al-Khidr, the young man, the young, uh, his, his actual disciple, al, uh, 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 his name, uh, Yusha ibn Nun, and then al-Khidr. What kind of test, what kind of trial was that? With regards to what? Knowledge. Knowledge. Subhanallah. Doesn't matter how much knowledgeable you are. It doesn't matter. Even if you have earned the highest degree of knowledge in academia, that no one will ever reach your level. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned a fact in the Quran. What is it, a jama'ah? Wa fawqa kulli di ilmin alim. And above every knowledgeable person, there is someone who's more knowledgeable. And above all, of course, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the story of Musa alayhi salam, why Musa was tested to go and become a disciple of someone like Al-Khidr, who was completely anonymous to him. Because of this, in the story of the seerah, and the, and the books of tafsir, Musa alayhi salam was among Bani Israel. So one of the people of Bani Israel, hearing what Musa is speaking about, or saying he was so fascinated by the, the amount of knowledge Musa has. Qala, ya Nabi Allah, ya Musa, ya Nabi Allah, is there anyone else who has more knowledge than you? Musa was hasty in his answer. He goes, no, I don't think so. He thought him being the messenger of Allah, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trusted him with the, with, the, with the message, he would have access to divine knowledge. I mean, if you have access to divine knowledge, tell me, were there any, anyone better than you in knowledge? I was just supposed to be not. That's what Musa assumed. So when Musa gave the answer hasty, he says, yeah, no, that's me. I have all the knowledge you want. Anything you ask me, I'll get it for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa, yeah, Musa, who told you that? Who said that? You know what? Go to such and such place, and make sure that you take with you your lunch and so and so. When you lose it, you will find someone there. Follow that man. That man was anonymous. Like, he was like, to Musa, like, this guy? 
Like many, many ulama, sometimes you don't even see them as ulama, but when you hear them speaking, you're just like, Wallahi, it's breathtaking. The amount of knowledge that, they, that comes out from their mouth, Allahu Akbar, unbelievable. They're very humble, they're very simple. They don't show off. It doesn't come on their, the way they dress, the way they walk, the way they, but they are, they are full with knowledge. Full with knowledge. So we're going to be tested by knowledge. Knowledge, at least the assumption of knowledge, produces what, your jama'ah? Arrogance. Because knowledge is power. When you think that you have the knowledge, you become more powerful, it produces and breeds arrogance. So make sure. Don't have that fitna of knowing, specifically the young ones, the youth. Because the youth, Masha, they're very eager to, you know, be independent. So they always think that they have everything, they know everything. The last fitna that was mentioned in the Surah Jama'ah, the story of whom? Dhul Qarnayn. What kind of fitna and trial was that? Power. Authority. He was the commander of the world, you could say. He was traveling everywhere freely. No one would stop him. He would change right and left in the east and the west and so on. All this by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he was tested. He came by a group of people, of some people that said, what, what, what's wrong with you guys? Because you know we have some creation of Allah azza wa jal. These people are massive. You can't stop them. They're, they're just causing fitna and causing, you know, all this mess all over the place, wherever they go. Could you please help us? Can you just create some sort of a wall or a barrier between us and them? And by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he did it. The point we learn from the story is this man was very powerful. He had all the knowledge, all the power, all the authority, all the armies. But he was never arrogant. He did not cross the limits. He never disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He utilized all of this for the sake of Allah azza wa Make sure if Allah has given you authority over people, if Allah has put you in a position to be ruling over other people, don't abuse that power. Don't abuse it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test you in the day of judgment. Now having said that, look at these four stories and these four trials and fit and temptations. When a Dajjal comes, what do people see in him? They see everything. They will be tested in their faith, in believing him being the God. And they will be tested in terms of his knowledge, like, whoa, he has all that kind of, you know, the weird thing that he produces, subhanAllah. The power that makes like, like magic comes from his hand. And he has the power of the authority, he could kill you. And he could even, as the Prophet ﷺ said, to the kunus, which means the treasures of the earth, come out and will come out. He has the wealth. All these spit and come in the hand of one man at the Dajjal. And people will be tested. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said that one of the greatest fitan that he left behind وسلم, is fitna to Dajjal, the fitna of the Dajjal. So he said, make sure that you protect yourself from the Dajjal. Always seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the Dajjal. Say, Jama'a, Allahumma na'udhu bika mi fitna to Dajjal. أعوذ بالله من فتنة الدجال أعوذ بالله من فتنة الدجال Always guard yourself and your family from this and make sure to memorize Surah Al-Kahf insha'Allah ta'ala to get that protection, Ya Rabbil Alameen. May Allah give you all protection against the Dajjal, Ya Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.